The overall goal of our research program um, is to understand uh, the causes and consequences of inequality. And what I want to do today is I want to tell you a little bit about our work aimed at addressing what the consequences of inequality are to a cell or to an organism and why we care about this. Let me define the word inequality uh, for you. So inequality means not euploid. And so then what does euploid mean? Euploid basically is defined by the chromosome of the species defining chromosome composition. Each species has its particular chromosome content, and euploidy says that a particular cell or a particular organism has the species defining chromosome composition. So when a cell or an organism is aneuploid, what that means is that it has a chromosome composition that is not the multiple of the euploid chromosome content. And this condition arises when chromosomes missegregate during cell division. And here is an example of a cell that's segregating its chromosomes. The chromosomes are in blue, and the apparatus that segregates these chromosomes are in red. And in the majority of cases, the vast majority of cases, this process occurs accurately, leading to the production of two identical daughter cells. And so for many years, and we have been studying the molecular mechanisms that make sure that the chromosomes are segregated accurately. And in fact, we're still, uh, a large part of my lab still very studies this problem. But what I want to focus on today is sort of this cell, where these safeguard mechanisms have failed and chromosomes are being missegregated. And as you can see here, there is a, there's a chromosome that's sort of being left behind in the middle, and this chromosome will end up being missegregated. And so, in a, well, and so for several years now, we've tr been trying to understand what are the consequences for a cell when chromosomes are being missegregated. And the reason why we're interested in this is because in all species where this has ever been studied, it's very clear that aneuploidy is highly detrimental. Being aneuploid is bad news for an organism. So I'm giving you a few examples if for the case of humans here. All autosomal monosomies, monosomy means you have one chromosome less than you should have, is lethal. All autosomal trisomies, meaning you have one chromosome too many, is lethal in the vast majority of the cases. Aneuploid is the leading cause of mental retardation in humans, and it's also the leading cause of miscarriages in humans with about 35% of all spontaneously, uh, spontaneous abortions being clinically recognized spontaneous abortions being due to the fact that the fetus is aneuploid. And then, of course, um, aneuploid is also, and that's the reason why we are particularly interested in the condition, is a key characteristic of cancer. More than 90% of all solid human, tum human tumors are aneuploid. And in the case of human tumors, we are not usually dealing with one chromosome gaining or one chromosome missing, but in, in, in cancers, very frequently, the aneuploidies are severely, severely um, affected, with multiple chromosomes being present in the incorrect number. So how, why and how aneuploidy causes so many different diseases and conditions in basically all organisms where this has been looked at is really not very well understood. And so several years ago, we decided to sort of ask what, ha what are the consequences of aneuploidy on a normal cell? And we've studied this question in two different settings. We created 20 different budding yeast strains with defined aneuploidies, usually one extra chromosome or two or three extra chromosomes, and we created primary mouse cells that carry one, one of four additional chromosomes. And I, during my talk, I will refer to these as trisomic uh, mouse cells. And so we took these cells and we began to study them, and I'm gonna show, now show you what we've learned. So we've learned, I think, three important things from these uh, aneuploid cell lines. The first thing we learned is that aneuploidy 
is not only bad news for an organism, it's also bad news for a cell. When you have an extra chromosome or you're missing chromosomes, that impacts your ability to divide and to proliferate. So we conclude that aneuploidy causes a proliferative disadvantage. The second thing we learned from these cells is that these cells have characteristics. They have what we call phenotypes. And they are chromosome specific. What do I mean by that? What, we, what, what that means is basic, basically each chromosome has a unique set of genes on it. And some of these genes, when they are present in the wrong copy number, will affect the cell in some way or another and causes a particular trait or a particular characteristic. So they have chromosome-specific phenotypes, but what was perhaps most interesting to us was that in addition to these chromosome-specific effects, we observed that our aneuploid cells actually shared, many of our aneuploid cells actually shared a number of phenotypes. And these phenotypes are indicative of proteotoxic stress and other stresses. What does proteotoxic stress mean? Proteotoxic stress means that the proteins in the cell are not folded right. And that can either be because the temperature is too high and the proteins start unfolding in the cells or because of chemicals that inhibit translation or that inhibit uh, protein folding. Or in, our, in, in the context of aneuploid cells, changes in the protein composition of the cell will cause proteotoxic stress. And actually, these cells have a number of other stresses that I'm um, not going to tell you about today. So let me show you one piece of data that supports this idea that aneuploid cells are stressed they have, uh, because of protein composition issues. So what I'm showing you here is a series of aneuploid yeast strains. They have one of several different chromosomes. And what we're looking at here is we're looking at a marker for protein folding stress. This is a protein called HSB-104. It's not really important what it does. But what, it, what, but what, it, what, what, we, what we use it for is it detects the consequences of proteotoxic stress in the cells. When, proteotox, when cells experience proteotoxic stress, what they do is the proteins start forming aggregates in the cell. And these aggregates are recognized by this protein HSB-104. And what we see in our aneuploid cells is that the number of HSB-104 foci in these cells is increased compared to the euploid control cells. And so this and many other experiments that I don't have time to show you led us to conclude that protein folding, protein homeostasis is disrupted in these cells. And of course, the question that immediately follows from this realization is why is that? Why do these cells have this particular phenotype? And one hypothesis that uh, we wanted, thought was reasonable and that we wanted to test was the idea that having extra chromosomes, these extra chromosomes are active, they're making additional proteins, and that causes protein imbalances in the cell, and that leads to proteotoxic stress. And so the first part of this hypothesis that we needed to test is to answer this, to test this hypothesis, the first question that we needed to answer was, are these chromosomes actually active, these additional chromosomes that, we that these strains harbored? And this uh, a slide here shows you that, that this is the case. What I'm showing you here is I'm showing you here a yeast strain that has an extra copy of chromosome 5. And I'm showing you the DNA content of that cell, the RNA content of that cell, and the protein content of that cell of these cells. And I'm arranging the genes in this particular yeast strain in the order in which they appear in, on the chromosomes. So I'm ordering them here. The left end of chromosome 1 is on this side of the plot. The right end, end of chromosome 16, yeast cells have 16 chromosomes, is at this end of the plot. And what I hope you appreciate is that there's a stretch in the genome that's present uh, in twofold increase. And that indeed corresponds to chromosome 5. So there's two copies of chromosome 5 in these cells. There's an, an according increase in the majority of RNAs produced from that chromosome. And there's about a, a, an approximate, also almost coordinate increase 
in uh, protein levels of, in, in these cells. So indeed, these chromosomes, these aneuploid chromosomes are active. They're being transcribed and translated. So the next question is, are these, um, is it these proteins that cause, or these gene products uh, are, that cause problems for the cells? And so to address this question, we took advantage of the fact that we can actually use a trick and introduce non-yeast DNA, large amounts of non-yeast DNA into yeast cells. We can take a chromosome worth of human DNA or mouse DNA and stick it into yeast cells. And these human and mouse pieces are usually not transcribed and almost certainly not translated. And we can then ask, what, 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 what effect will that have on our yeast strains? Will we see the same effects as putting in an additional yeast chromosome or not? And the answer was very clear. The answer was that putting chromosome size amounts of human or mouse DNA into these yeast cells basically had hardly any phenotypes. And so from this experiment and many other experiments, we concluded it is indeed that these additional chromosomes are active and they cause problems for the cells. And so from these experiments, we concluded that an aneuploid stress response exists in yeast and in mouse. I didn't show you any data for the mouse, but we see remarkably similar things in yeast and in mouse. And we believe that, that they are caused by protein, changes in protein homeostasis, protein stoichiometry imbalances, and that um, uh, causes these phenotypes. So let me sort of, sort of illustrate this for you in more detail uh, with the next slide. So imagine you have a protein complex that's composed of protein A and protein B. They're encoded by genes on different chromosomes. And so it's actually quite difficult for a cell to make exactly the same amount of protein A and the same amount of protein B to form this uh, complex. So the way cel cells solve this problem is they make approximately the same amount of A and B and then use protein quality control pathways uh, to sort of eliminate excess subunits. And there's wonderful examples for this already described in the literature. So if you now take an aneuploid cell, you immediately appreciate that this problem of excess uh, stoichiometry imbalances greatly becomes increased. All of a sudden, there's hundreds or thousands sometimes, depending on the size of the chromosomes, more proteins in the cell that sort of need to be dealt with. And so we speculate, or is our hypothesis, that this causes an increased burden on the protein quality control pathways of the cell, and therefore leads to this proteotoxic stress, these aggregates that we're seeing in the cells. And we're currently testing the idea that the other stresses that we see in these aneuploid cells are in fact also caused by these changes in protein composition caused by aneuploidy. So where are we going from here? Or what are we currently uh, uh, doing to sort of continue to study this important, um, uh, th 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 this condition? So obviously we are very much interested in further studying the cellular and organismal effects of aneuploidy. But as I told you in the beginning of my talk, we are very interested in sort of understanding the relationship between aneuploidy and these diseases it is associated with. And so what we're here trying to do here, such in particular uh, cancer, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to identify genetic or other chemical um, um, alterations that either enhance or suppress these adverse effects of aneuploidy. We're hoping that genetic alterations that suppress the adverse effects of aneuploidy will actually teach us something about tumor evolution. All these, these tumors are aneuploid. Aneuploidy per se is actually detrimental. So for a tumor cell to take advantage of potential beneficial effects of aneuploidy, it needs to sort of evolve mutations that allow it to suppress the adverse effects of aneuploidy. And we've already began these efforts and then we've actually identified mutations that hyperactivate protein degradation as having these properties. The flip side to this question is, is it possible for us to identify conditions that allow us to enhance 
key adverse effects of inequality. The hope here would be that if we find genetic alterations or perhaps even chemicals that selectively kill aneuploid cells but do not or affect euploid cells less, that such strategies eventually could lead to the development of new tum uh, uh, tumor therapeutics. And again, in initial efforts, we've identified energy and proteotoxic stress-inducing compounds as having such properties. The rationale for this uh, enhancement here is aneuploid cells are already under prototoxic and energy stress, and sort of further exaggerating that will lead to what geneticists call a synthetic lethality. And so if I have time, I would like to show you one piece of data about two of those compounds that we have found. It doesn't really matter what they are. One is an energy stressor. The other one is a prototoxic stressor. And what we found is that they selectively inhibit not only the proliferation of aneuploid primary cells, but also aneuploid cancer cells. So these are the data I'm showing you for the effects of one of those compounds, ICAR, on primary aneuploid cells, these trisomic mouse cells that I introduced to you in the beginning of my talk. You can see treating them with ICAR has selectively more significant effects on the growth of the trisomic compared to the normal cells. And uh, we are very excited about the possibility that these compounds also work in human tumor cells. So what the experiment we're doing here is we have one human tumor cell line that is low-grade aneuploid, meaning it doesn't have a lot of chromosomal aberrations. And we have one human cancer cell line that is highly aneuploid. And we can take these human uh, tumor cells and we can inject them into a new mouse and they will start forming a tumor. And when we don't, when we you know, don't treat these human tumors, you can see the low-grade aneuploidy on the left make, forms a tumor that's about the same size as the high-grade aneuploidy on the right. But when we now treat um, these mice with a combination of ICAR and 17-AG, I hope you appreciate that the tumor on the left is relatively less affected compared to the tumor on the light, right. So sort of as a, uh, th these data raise the interesting possibility that the aneuploid state of a tumor cell line can determine the efficacy of these two compounds. I want to be very clear here. I don't, I by no means uh, mean to suggest that these compounds, the differential effect is only due to the aneuploid state of these tumor cell lines, but they could definitely, uh, we would argue, contribute. So sort of, uh, let me briefly summarize where um, I think this um, a project in the lab is going to and what we think our findings, uh, what the implications of our findings are. I think our data clearly indicate that aneuploid causes a proliferative disadvantage. We would argue that during tumor evolution, such a disadvantage needs to be overcome to take advantage of potential beneficial effects of the condition. I think our data raise the interesting possibility that cancer cells may more heavily depend on the mechanisms that help cells deal with the stresses associated with this uh, survival. And I think in this regard, it's very interesting to note that a recent sequencing effort of multiple myelomas at the Broad uh, actually identified many mutations in proteins involved in protein homeostasis and protein quality control. So that will certainly be consistent with our findings. And I think a very much important, though albeit long-term goal of our studies is to identify conditions, compounds that selectively um, inhibit the growth of aneuploid cells in the hope that these eventually may provide new therapeutic targets uh, uh, for tumor therapy in the future. And with that, I'd like to sort of end by thanking the people who were involved in this effort. Those are it's the yeast team that are led by Eduardo Torres, uh, who studied um, the consequences of aneuploid in the yeast, and the mouse people, uh, again, uh, led by talented postdoc in the lab, Brett Williams. And I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>